here is John. Uh, we're starting the workshop of John Beasley right now. Please welcome John Beasley. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure uh, to be here and to be discussing music, something I assume we all love. And uh, uh, inspire us to keep doing, going forward and learning new things. Um, and uh, it's great for me uh, as an American to be here playing in Russia because I believe that um, I believe that uh, music is a much stronger dialogue than politics. Yes. All right. I just want to get that out of the way. I have a few notes here. Um, actually, before we get started, I'd like to know, because music production is a very broad topic, so um, can I ask how many maybe musicians are here today, tonight? Ah, okay, great. You're almost all musicians. And um, how many people are interested in uh, record production? Okay. And maybe uh, like live show production, like International Jazz Day? Okay, good. All right. So we're on track here. Um, so what I'd like to talk about, to at least start the discussion, is uh, how producing a record is very much like producing a concert or even producing a festival. You know, Inter International Jazz Day is actually a 90-minute jazz festival. So it, it's uh, very similar to what, uh, so we have some of the similar challenges as what the, the other panel was discussing today, right? Um, and the same with uh, producing a record. Um, who is your audience? Who, what is, what, what is it that, that is inside of you that, that you want to present to the world and how can you get them to listen to it, right? Um, so with, with Jazz Day, uh, our mandate is to present to the world uh, artists from all over the, the world uh, how despite uh, different politic, pol political backgrounds and uh, language, uh, how we can come together and uh, just through the basic communication of the love of music have uh, show the humanity that music is and how how uh, sort of to celebrate our differences right um, so we do this by uh, inviting uh, musicians from all over the world and, and, and trying to get a, a picture of, of what, what they, what their artistry is and to put them in maybe a different situation that they've never been in before, right? Um, and also to celebrate the host country. Like in Cuba, we, um, we, uh, we had Yun Sun Na, who's a great South Korean singer, right? So we asked her to sing Bescame Mucho in Spanish, right? Um, with Esperanza Spalding and, and uh, um, a, a pianist from Lebanon, right? So this is sort of like, um, like a jazz festival. You, you'd have, you know, Esperanza's band, you'd have Yunson Na's band, you know, except this is in 90 minutes, right? Um, let me get my notes here so we can. And please let me know if I'm speaking too fast. I'm not used to uh, um, not hearing the interpreter next to me in a way, you know? It's okay so far? Okay. All right. So when you're, when you're producing a new artist, you, 
on a record, you have sort of a similar challenge of, of getting um, your music heard to a broader audience. Uh, in Jazz Day, um, like in Perugia, we have uh, Annie Lennox, we have a pop star, someone to draw in uh, people that nor normally don't listen to jazz, right? Uh, we have we had Annie Lennox, Femi Kuti, Aretha has done it, Joss Stone. But what's interesting is that, uh, and what's fun as a producer, and my job as a producer is to put uh, Aretha, you know, with uh, Robert Glasper or something like this. It's a, it's a, it's a dream, you know, or, or have Dafir Youssef, who's a, a North African singer and oud player, uh, sing a John Lennon song with Herbie Hancock, you know? So it's this kind of programming that, that hopefully hooks people in so that when it's time for you to play your music, people, people will be interested right off the bat, right? Um, so uh, having said this, it's also important not to come off as a gimmick, right? Because ultimately, if you're an artist uh, and uh, you have to be honest with yourself, right? So the challenge is, of course, to be true to yourself because people, people will, they can tell if you're not being genuine. You understand? You know? If, if, you're, if you're saying, okay, I want a rap tune on my record because rap is popular and you're not feeling this, then this is not a good way to go either, you know? So it's important to be, uh, to, find, to find your voice, right? And, and, and stick to your voice, but but with an open mind so that if you get a, an opportunity to bring in uh, uh, someone that could help you get your music out to a broader public, that you can do this, right? It's a fine balancing act here, all right? Okay. Um, so uh, maybe I can talk about how um, we can, how how we start the production process of Jazz Day, and I can show how similar it is to uh, the, the pre-production of, uh, of a record, right? Um, so we, we find a host city. We're very happy to come to St. Petersburg. Um, we, we talk with Igor about uh, some of the great Russian musicians, right? Um, I've played with a lot of them just over the last two years. Um, they're playing in the jazz orchestra, and I've heard uh, a lot of great musicians here. So that's that's great. So uh, so now we reach out to uh, a, a few Americans. <laughs> um, I think Diane Rees might come, a few other people, uh, and. Um, some musicians from Africa, whatnot. So, so uh, how can we, uh, you know, uh, how can I find a great drummer that can play with an African artist and a Russian pianist, right? You know. So what I do is um, I, I listen to this music. I listen to a great Russian artist, and and uh, maybe I find a, a few records to listen to, and. Um, uh, I listen for uh, songs that I think that he can, uh, that, that we can present with a Cuban drummer, say, you know. So I talk with him, and uh, what's important to me is that uh, for him to be comfortable, but also uh, to challenge him at the same time, right? So, so this to me makes uh, Jazz Day a, a special event in that way. I'm getting hot here. Um, yeah. um, 
then we talk, um, I go back to the producer, uh, to Michelle and Tom and, and UNESCO, and I say, well, here's three great songs. What do you think of these? You know, and then uh, I go back uh, to the drawing board again. And this is the fun part for me because I get to dream up scenarios of, uh, you know, who gets to play with who. And, and then um, we, we decide on a program. And the other challenge with Jazz Day is, uh, is how, uh, it's because most jazz artists, you know, we like to play long solos and stuff, right? But because we're presenting to an international audience and it's a TV show, you know, it's, it's not a record, it's a TV show. So these songs are like four minutes each, you know? Um, so uh, one of the big challenges a few years ago when we were at the White House is I think we had four or five Miles Davis alumni. Um, Chick Corea, Herbie, um, Marcus Miller, John McLaughlin, Wayne, and me, right? So we decided to, to try to do Spanish Key from Bitches Brew. Well, on Spanish Key on um, Bitches Brew is, I think, you know, at least 15 minutes long on the record, right? So uh, how, do we, how do we make an arrangement that to pay tribute to Miles in four minutes? How do we do this, you know? So one of the tricks is, is to, to, as an arranger, to find the little cues Miles would play. Suba duba dooba duba dooba And having played with Miles, we all knew that this was sort of the cue to go to the next section, right? Because the, the song is built on vamps. Um, so we found a form somehow in there. And um, I, I felt like Tio Maceo, you know, four minute version from Tio Maceo. Um, uh, and one of the tricks with television is that you have a, at the end of the stage from, at the end of the audience where the cameras are and the producer sits, it's a huge clock, you know, that times it out. So, so we, were, we were playing, but also looking at the clock, knowing that, you know, at 45 seconds is the next cue. Um, so uh, that was sort of a, an interesting way to, to improvise, you know, to a clock. But like you say, like I said, you know, you do these things, um, um, you sort of, uh, what would you say, they're uh, compromises in a way, you know, for the, for the big picture of jazz to get, get the word out to everyone, you know. You know, it's a spectacle, you know. Yeah. Are there any questions? Yeah? Not yet, huh? Don't be shy. Yeah. Um, so the next step in the situation is is we is the rehearsal, right? And 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 uh, we have we have travel schedules, you know. When does this person arrive, you know? And uh, uh, are they available for the rehearsal? Or are they not available for the rehearsal? So usually we have the hall for two days, and we. Um, um, oh, I should back up. After we're, I've set the program and make the arrangements, it's very important, like in a record, you, uh, you, you send, uh, nowadays through the internet, it's very easy, you send the music out to each musician with an MP3 and the lead sheet so that when they come to the gig, they're prepared. Because basically we have about 20 minutes for each artist um, to rehearse and to also do a sound check at the same time. So this is like doing a jazz record, you know, um, you know, budgets are usually low, you don't have a lot of time in the studio. So, the, you know, how, how as a producer can I make everyone feel relaxed enough and to feel natural and to play what's in their heart and what's in their soul, right? This is a big challenge because as jazz musicians, we're we're like, oh, it's got to be amazing every time. It's got to be burning. It's got to be this. It's got to be that. Well, if you're always like watching the clock and trying to learn the music at the same time, 
and worried about the sound engineer and is, how's it sound in there? Is it, how are the people going to like it? You have to do all that way before you get into the studio, you know? So that's what we try. That's the same concept I try for Jazz Day, you know? I try to, when I'm producing a jazz record, I try to get people to rehearse or play gigs live. It's even better. Have the music, uh, the concept of music done way in advance. And, uh, you know, um, how to cast, you know, to make your, your music uh, come off as best as way with, with the musicians that you have available to you. Um, and as a producer, you know, my job would be to help the artist with this big picture he wants to present so, so that he can relax and not be worried about, uh, you know, how does it sound in the booth? Um, so the techniques we use for this are, uh, you know, if number one, hire a recording engineer whose sound that you like and who's fast and who can, um, uh, who also knows enough music uh, to follow the form of a jazz song. So when you tell him I need to go to the bridge, I need to go to second A, he knows exactly what you're talking about. Because when we're doing jazz productions, you're moving fast, right? Uh, also, it's important that the engineer mixes as he records. There's nothing worse than playing your heart out on a take and coming back into the booth and it's like, it's not inspiring to listen to at all. Some engineers think, oh yeah, we're gonna mix later. No, you gotta mix so you inspire, right? It's super important. Or else, you know, the guy comes back and goes, well, that's not what I played. Or that's not what it sounded like on my earphones or, you know. Uh, you know, it can be a real drag and kind of a bummer if you go back in the booth and it's, it's sounding flat and uninspiring. So, this is like jazz day. We have to set up, we have to have great engineers, monitor mixers, because we have 20 minutes for each song. And, you know, you're talking people like uh, Christian McBride and, you know, Herbie and Wayne and Dee Dee and, you know, people that are used to a certain way, right? So the monitor guy has to come early and he has to make sure it's really set up before we come. The house engineer, because he only has 20, 20 minutes to learn the song as well. Uh, so he has to make it good for the house so that the audience, the live audience helps the musicians, you know, they, they're excited, it sounds good to them. And then the truck where we have uh, uh, the recording and where we send it out through the internet or uh, later for editing with video, um, he's got to learn the song too. So I, I always send the engineers the same things I send the musicians so they can do their homework because we're moving fast. TV and video and live concerts are like jazz records. Fast. So the other thing you can do to, to help your record come off in a more um, uh, freer way for your expression to come out is also if, if you get stuck in a tune, you know, and you're doing take after take after take after take and it's just not, it's not feeling right. It's really important sometimes just to move on. You can always circle back later. If you have one day in the studio, you don't have time to like, you know, not only will that take not happen, but because you're rushing through the rest of your songs, that's not gonna happen either, you know. So it's really important not to get bogged down by uh, an uninspiring song or take, or it's just not the right time yet, you know. Unfortunately, we don't do that with Jazz Day because, <laughs> uh, you know, we can't just move on. We, we have a set program, you know. But we do everything we can uh, in the, in the pre-production to, to make sure everybody uh, 
is comfortable. Actually, no, we have done this once before. Some, one time at rehearsal, just wasn't kind of coming together right. So we just actually switched to another tune, and it was like magic. Everybody was, was, was good. Um, so any questions about pre-production? Please? Yeah, you guys know, know all this? I'm not saying anything new. Yeah? Please, yeah. Uh, I think we have a microphone for you. So my question is, so when you have the preparation for studio, so you book, you, you have your studio booked, you have the band, you know what exactly you're going to perform there in the record. Uh, but then s some changes might come. Some, s some changes might come. And uh, what's the right way to uh, accept the changes or st be in that, uh, yeah. the, the, well, the older direction? Yeah. Uh, as a producer, how how you supposed to react to that? Uh, a, a big lesson from Quincy Jones. Quincy says, when you're in the studio, you have to leave the door open for God to walk in. Meaning, we're capturing the moment. And if, if the change is a good idea, then change it. You know, if it's making, if it's a good change where it's making the musicians, uh, uh, if they like the change, chances are it's a good idea. You know, if it's making the, the, the chart easier to play or, or, or blossoming into a new, a new way, you know, when you're, when you're recording jazz, you're recording the moment, not not some pre preconceived thing from two months ago, you know? Unless your music is really written out and notated all the time, which is borderline jazz anyway, right? Um, you know, um, it's important to, to be able to be open and to capture the moment, whatever that moment is, right? And, 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 and because so much of pop music and classical music is not like that. This is what makes our music stand out. Because it truly is improvised. It's what's happening now, right? That's why if you get bogged down with the take, you know, and it's, it's not the moment you want to capture, you move on and come back again. Because chances are the next song, uh, you know, will be fresh, you know? Does this answer the question? Okay, good. Yes. Just a minute. Uh, the lady over here. Hi. Hi, my name is Maria. I'm a musician, a local musician. First of all, thank you very much for coming and thank you very much for doing this uh, workshop for us. Uh, my question is, as a producer, every time you're receiving lots of uh, recordings from young musicians, what are you paying attention on? What, is, what makes the artist unique from your point of view? What are ah, you paying attention on? Right. right. Thank you. Um, Originality is number one for me. Um, this music was born, jazz music was born from uh, uh, a way of, to communicate uh, a bit subversiveness, right? Um, from poverty, right? So this is a way for musicians and people to get together and feel good about themselves. But, and also to, to sort of talk about, what, well, the blues is about, you know, the challenges they face, right? So the originality part comes from, in those days, if you didn't have your own sound, 
you know, you, you were supposedly sort of a, you know, a, a, a lower class of a musician, you know. They'll, these guys are like Charlie Parker and even Benny Goodman and uh, Bud Powell and Thelonious Monk and, and Dizzy. Um, Jimmy Heath is still alive today. And he told me this from his words. He said, if you did not dress a, your own way, you, did, you couldn't dress like Charlie Parker. You had to dress your way, right? You all had this hipster language. They all made up their own language. You know, a uh, funny way of talking or a unique, I should say, way of talking. Uh, and this translated into their playing. You, you could not, for one thing, there were no jazz schools, right? This music was word of mouth or as, as many musicians learned from older musicians. Jazz musicians, we bring, our, we, we bring up our own kids, right? You had Art Blakey and uh, Duke Ellington. Th these were the school, right? The jam sessions, the cutting sessions, right? So if, if, you, sh if you showed up playing like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Coleman Hawkins, okay, yeah, that's cool, that's cool, but you weren't going to, you weren't going to stand out, you know. And, and, and um, this is something that really, I feel, was a huge part of jazz that, that we love about jazz, right? And this, to me, is a, is a thing that, that, that really needs to be discussed in academia, in jazz academia, that, you know, this music is from the streets and it's social music. Miles Davis called this social music. He hated the word jazz. So in order to be so social, you know, if I talk to like, um, um, I don't know, if I talk to like, uh, like a, a certain actor all the time, you'd be go, why, why, why do you talk like this all the time? You know, you know, who are you, right? So this is what I listen to. I, I try to find it. Do, do, the, do they have a unique approach? Whether it's writing or playing or singing, especially singers, you know. Um, uh, so that's one thing I look for. Uh, um, and then I, maybe I think like, well, um, how can we present this to the world like we were talking about earlier? What makes this unique enough? And, and how, how can we sort of present this in a way to bring more people in, uh, right? OK. Yeah, please. Thank you, Mr. Billy. Do you think uh, at this time is it still possible the musical creativity and the originality? And what's your opinion about the, the influence that can uh, make the social and familiar uh, media uh, into the musicians to produce the, uh, their music actually? Right. Uh, Thank you. Did you ask me the first part of that question again? Yeah, if it's possible, the creative originality and the creativity after the quantity, oh, sure. the amount of the music that it's been produced yet. Yeah, I mean, I think we have a lot of unique artists today. Um, the problem is, is, is back in 1940, there was a sort of a small group playing this music, you know? So if you were different, you, you probably got heard. Now, nowadays, there's, you know, there's millions of people playing this music of jazz, you know? So um, that's the challenge, right? Um, yeah, there's so much more happening now. But I think musicians like Craig Taborn, you know, he doesn't sound like anybody, you know? He has his own thing. Um, certainly Robert Glasper has found his niche, you know? Um, I don't know, I could go on and on, on and on, yeah. But, but yeah, I think it's definitely possible. If you listen to new music, um, you know, Takamitsu, uh, you know, um, um, uh, the classical music, I think creativity, I think, that, I think because also because of human evolution, if you listen to young musicians nowadays, oh my God, man, they have so much facility because we've evolved as physically as humans and mentally as humans. Now you can watch somebody on YouTube and play along with that, a live concert, you know? 
you know, this helps every, the gaming has made every, every kid so fast, you know. This is why, uh, you know, um, sorry, I have to go, no. <laughs> uh, uh, that's why, you know, all these, that's why athletic records are broken all the time throughout history, you know. So it's, yeah, I think creativity is, it's might, it might not be what we like, you know, but I think it's at an all-time high and will always be at an all-time high, you know. But the, but the key is to be true to yourself, to, to, as an artist, to find that quiet space so that you can really hear what your music sounds like in your head and make it your mission to, to try to get that out. Otherwise, you're playing someone else, right? Yeah. Can I ask a question? I'm sorry? sorry. Right. Well, it's just happening at, at a rapid pace because of Facebook, right? The social aspect of this music is, uh, is changing so much faster than it used to. Yeah. Um, I don't really know how to comment on that. Sorry. My name is Oleg Mohov. I tried to ask you the question. Uh, for example, how the Russian music and the Russian sound of the vocalist the hear, when you hear the Russian's language, which no nothing means for you, how do you feel and what do you feel about the Russian sound of music? As a first question, and the second one, if you will be able to be an in international jazz um, producer, what kind of Russian song you choose for all of the uh, musicians? Right, right, yeah, I would love to try to find, I, I don't have the answer to the second question because I need to, to absorb more, but how great would it be to play a jazz arrangement of Skorabin or, uh, you know, Rachmaninoff or, yeah, well, I mean, you have such a ri rich history here of, of, of incredible musicians and, and composers. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I look forward to hearing more uh, Russian artists and, and trying, to, trying to hear more of, of what maybe their sound is and what, what makes them different from uh, everyone else. Aside from the technique, I mean, technique-wise, man, the Russian people, man, have amazing technique. Pianists, singers, you know. So, I mean, singing-wise is really interesting because one of the things as a producer I've, I've run into before with other vocalists is, is they, 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 especially international vocalists, when they start singing jazz, they don't want to, their accent to show. And I think this is the wrong idea here. What... What makes James Taylor sound different from every other American is his use of diction. Show me the way, you know. You know, uh, how Sarah Vaughan, show me the way, you know. It's the way they, they use diction is so important. This is why I love to hear Brazilian singers sing in English. I especially love in Portuguese, but you know, I think that I think that you should use your accent to your advantage. It's what makes you you, you know. If you homogenize and take all the fat out, then you have watery milk. I don't know. It's just my own opinion. I, I'd much prefer to hear, you know, a French singer sing if she's gonna sing in English with her French accent. It makes it great. Yeah. What's the sound of Russian pronunciation? It's rhythmic. What's the sound of Russian pronunciation? Yeah, it, to me, I hear a lot of rhythm in your language. No? Yeah? Yeah. 
Yeah, this is what I hear. Um, uh, again, you know, this is my, it's actually my third time in Russia in about a year and a half, so I don't know a lot. So, uh, but I, I look forward to knowing more. Yes. Uh, the microphone? Oh, sir, do you have the microphone? Извините, пожалуйста. Меня зовут Попов Иван. Я вокалист. Такой вопрос это касается работы в студии. Иногда бывают такие моменты в работе, что Здравствуйте, очень рад вас здесь видеть. Здравствуйте. Maybe someone here can translate for him. Hello. Здравствуйте. Джон, рад вас здесь видеть. Здравствуйте. Джон, здравствуйте. Меня зовут Иван. Рад вас здесь видеть. У меня такой вопрос, он касается работы в студии, именно записей. Бывают такие рабочие моменты, когда ты делаешь дубли, песня, и какой-то из дублей получается очень хорошо эмоционально наполненный и хорошо спет, но не везде чисто. А бывает чистый дубль, но недостаточно насыщенный, и человек, который записывает, говорит, лучше оставить эмоционально насыщенный и автотюном подправить. Вот как вы думаете, какой из вариантов лучше, и как вы вообще относитесь к использованию автотюна в записях, в том числе в профессиональных записях? Музыки джаз, фанк, сол. Спасибо. Number one, emotion and groove, right? Because you can always go back and fix little things. So when I'm listening to takes and are playing on a take, I want, number one, what makes me in this situation move and dance, what makes, uh, which take the musicians felt, you know, alive on, and, what's, and when they're talking together after a take, whether they're high-fiving or, or, you can tell, this is easy. This is why it's important to have um, separation um, in the studio, right? So your bass player is direct, right? The drums are direct. So the little things you can take care of easy, you know? The, uh, so, you, so, you, so you do a few takes, and, and then one has more emotion, but maybe you miss a few things. Uh, these things you can fix easy, you know, especially now. You know, with Pro Tools and, uh, you know, I've, I've been in situations where maybe half the take is really great and another half from another take. And you put, you can put them together easily, you know. Yeah, we live in a whole new world now. Um, so, yeah, I, I think you have to go for emotion. Yeah, and feel and groove, especially in your situation. Джон, добрый день. Мое имя Валерий. Я музыкант, музыкальный продюсер, аранжировщик. Джон, добрый день. Мое имя Валерий. Я музыкант, музыкальный продюсер, аранжировщик. И раз уже зашел разговор именно о музыкальном продакшене, такой вопрос, может быть, чуть более узкоспециализированный. 
А как вы относитесь к использованию электронных битов, лупов, возможно, в той музыке, которую вы продюсируете, возможно, продолжение вот той линии альбома Майлза Дэвиса «Дубоб», да, когда он задал вот своим последним альбомом для линии развития. Как вы вообще относитесь к сочетанию вот этих вот жестких электронных структур, этих битов и той свободы, той импровизационной импровизационного характера джаза, насколько они совместимы, какой, какие вообще перспективы вы видите в развитии именно этой линии музыкального продюсирования? Спасибо. Right. Um, early on, uh, well, let's just say this. Musical instruments are being developed as we speak now. Every day there is a new uh, uh, instrument, if you will, right? Um, so I think it's important as creative musicians to embrace this technology, for sure. The problem when it's new is, and in this case, doo-wop or doo-bop or from that era, is that the loops were always uh, stagnant, right? They just stay there, right? Um, so to me, it's if you're going to use a loop, it's it's what you you uh, put on top of it or with, you know, the right musician that can still react to a stagnant loop and somehow it spurs creativity. John Hassel is a genius at this. And it doesn't have to be a drum loop. It can be even just a little piece of uh, Shostakovich, you know, where you're manipulating, right? But nowadays, as time has gone on, we have software like Ableton Live where you know it's much more uh, uh, open-ended and reactive you know uh, you can comp like a piano player in a way you know uh, the same kind of concept and now and because of computers have been around for 20 years or so now you have a lot of a lot of people that can that's their instrument you know they know how to get around that and, and to do it live you know Um, so I, I think it's important to embrace this. This is new. Uh, this is like the harpsichord, you know, years and years ago. Yeah, bring it on, you know. Um, uh, of course, there's a time and place for everything, right? You know. So uh, uh, I think it's maybe your job as a producer to, to, uh, to like the chef, uh, does it have too much butter? You know, you have to be... Uh, You have to use your intuition whether it's 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 not it's working or not or how much you need in there you know yeah is that okay all right yes possible yeah uh, going back to your uh, music production experience uh, could you please give one or probably two examples what do you believe was your most failure project in respect to music production? What failed. was it? Failure, yes. Failed. Ah, and, and there were many. No. Oh, really? <laughs> and uh, the, the second question is connected to the first one. Why? What mm, was wrong? That's good. Wow. <laughs> well, as an artist, you know, I'm always a little harder on my own projects. Um, I did a I did a record uh, called Surfacing, uh, maybe 15, 20 years ago now, um, and it was a period before this where I hadn't recorded a lot uh, under my own name, and I was I was doing a lot of studio work, uh, you know, TV, films, sort of commercial work, so I, to me I had kind of lost a bit of my. Uh, my essence of really who I am, right? So uh, I started getting together with one of my mentors. His name is Charles Moore. He was a fantastic, I ended up learning so much from this, this man. Um, so I started listening to, uh, um, um, you know, a lot of Miles and Water Babies and uh, records that I really loved coming up, Nefertiti, and this sort of sound, right? I wanted this, and I started working with him on new harmonic concepts, like trying to 
what I would call stretch the octave, like voicings with, uh, um, you know, uh, how do I say this? Uh, uh, and and in also Indian music, where I was experimenting with rag, and and how uh, they play one mode going up and another mode going down. So I was trying to do all this, and and. Um, also, it was a situation where I was paying for it myself, you know, sort of early on, you know, I, and, and actually uh, we, we were going to put the record out ourselves, which was sort of the beginning of all this do-yourself stuff, right? So um, um, I, I got these tunes down, and, and because I was concentrating so hard on, on trying to stick to my harmonic concept, to me the record comes off as sort of flat and and um, uh, not not open with it, not creative. The creative it was it was too much creativity in the pre-production and then not enough creativity afterward. I couldn't let go, right? I couldn't get out of my way. So people like this record. It's cool, you know, it sounds very kind of delicate and, whew, you know, for me, uh, not enough digging in, you know, it's sort of kind of one dynamic. Um, and maybe I didn't, you know, hire the right musician maybe at one point or whatever that, that could help me with this, you know. Um, so, yeah, I learned that, ah, and after this record, I, I read the book Effortless Mastery, and then I discovered, man, I, you know, it's great to come up with all these concepts when you're practicing and learning, and but you also have to practice letting go. It was a huge lesson for me, not only as a musician and a player, but as a composer and arranger and a producer. I don't think I could do jazz day and, uh, you know, some of these other TV productions I've done, live, live music, without this jazz lesson, actually, going back to my roots. You know, when, when bebop musicians were doing this, they practiced a lot, and they practiced scales, but when they hit the stage, they just communicated, you know? And you can't worry about the mistakes, you know? And Miles always said this, you know, there are mistakes, there are no, no mistakes, and he's right. Because if you let yourself go and play through the mistakes, so much of the time you will, you will come up with gold because that will be new, you know? Um, so, yeah, that's my lesson from surfacing. Yeah. Uh, maybe back here. Hi, nice to meet you. Thank you for coming. Okay. Nice um, to meet you I have two questions. The first one is continuation of the previous about using autotune, but about jazz. Like, I want to uh, know your attitude to autotune and jazz. And the second one, uh, you said like uh, if you have like several se sessions, and you can take the first part of it and the second one. But uh, as I understand, for example, if you're playing jazz you can um, use like different tempos. I mean, they can uh, be a little bit different. And how, how, um, how can you combine them? I mean, do you, do you use metronome or, th or something to make it, um, how do you say? Um, Let's do one question at a time. Uh, okay, the first, the first thing, and this might sound a little harsh as far as auto-tune goes, but it is my opinion that if you are a jazz singer or a classical singer and you have a pitch problem, then maybe you should think of something else. Sorry, right? Because what we do in jazz is, like I said, we're in the moment, you know? Okay, if, you have a, if you're like a, a pop singer or, you know, you have a certain vibe or, you know, whatever, and you want to use auto-tune, okay, fine. You know, to me, it's, 
it's ridiculous that, you know, you hear stories of Annie Lennox who can sing her butt off, you know, auto-tuning herself. It's ridiculous. So that's my, my feeling about that. Now, creatively, you know, there are some very cool things you could do with auto-tune that, uh, or Melodyne, for instance, that, are, that, that have nothing to do with just correcting pitch. You can harmonize stuff. You can, you can do really interesting things for that. Okay, so the next question was? What do you guys think of that? That debate. Yeah? Oh, yeah. the second. Yeah, how are you going to do auto tune on a gig? <laughs> the second was like uh, about combining, I mean, different sessions. For example, if you have a band, so do you use metronome like to glue them? I don't know, how, like different parts of the session? Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, you made a take. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry, yeah, 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 sure, sure. Well, it depends. I mean, if, if you're with, uh, with musicians that don't fluctuate too often, you know, um, it's not necessarily uh, to have a take, uh, to, to have a click, you know. I've, I've done j lots of jazz records where, you know, uh, you know, where we didn't use a, a, a click, you know. That's, but I also feel that um, the click should not uh, make you play stiff. I don't believe that a click makes you feel play stiff, you know? To me, it's just like having another musician in the band that you're playing to, you know? It's the conductor, if you will. So uh, I've done jazz records. In fact, my last jazz record, uh, Monkestro Volume 2, we almost did the whole thing to a click, you know? Because we were so spread out in the studio, you know, and we played live, you know? So it was kind of, uh, it made it sort of cohesive a little bit better, you know. To me, it's no different from playing with a drum loop or a shaker or whatever. You know, you make music with whatever. And, you know, uh, so if you're a musician uh, and you have problems playing with the click, practice to the metronome, right? Of course, it, it, it makes it a lot easier to cut, for sure. But, you know, in jazz, you know, in this music, it's okay if tempos go like this, man. It's not supposed to be, you know, uh, even James Brown's music kind of goes like, it has to breathe, you know. And it's okay. And if you find a spot to edit where it, it dips a little bit, chances are your listener is not going to catch that as much as you who saw it happen, you know. But you have to use your own judgment, you know. You have to. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You have to find another way. I don't know if we can do a YouTube video here or not. Um, I have a, um, there's a short video of, of uh, the making of um, my record Monkestra. And it kind of shows uh, sort of some of the techniques that we had. And uh, I'll tell you one thing, the challenge that we had making this record was that uh, it was 16 people and a very small budget. And we had two days to record, record, do all the solos, overdubs, uh, 10 songs. And the music was hard. I wrote a little bit too hard. Um, but um, what we did was we had rehearsals, you know. The difference was that in volume one, we had played the music a lot live performed it for a year or some some of the songs up to a year you know so we we were in we were already swinging when we went in the studio volume two had to happen very fast I had to write the arrangements very fast uh, and you know that's a good good thing a lot of times a lot of a deadline can be a very creative thing you know you know because you start getting into this flow you know okay it's got to be done and and you know, your, your mind gets trained to, to work faster and, and also you don't over edit yourself as an arranger or as a composer because you don't have time to second guess. And a lot of times that's very good, you know, uh, to go with your initial, what you initially hear, your initial instinct. So, um, yeah, yeah, so, so we got to the studio 
um, we're all kind of spread out. After two tunes, we decide, you know, we should probably play a click, you know. And, and at that point, you have to decide what kind of click. For a jazz tune, you know, you know, uh, you don't want this. Or ding, 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 ding. So it still has a bigger space. The beat is a bigger, has a wider place to fluctuate. This makes it a little looser, you know. Um, I don't know if they're trying to get the video together or not, but um, I'd love to see, uh, show you. So it was a different challenge. I'd written a little harder music, and, uh, you know, um, unfortunately, uh, our lead player, lead trumpet player showed up, and he wasn't, wasn't having a great day in a way. And, uh, you know, which happens for trumpet players. We all know that, you know. And uh, so we had to switch. I had to get a guy sitting next to him to help him out, you know. And in this case, we had to overdub. What we did was we found a really, the, the real take that we like. And sometimes we'd have to punch the whole band. You understand? Um, instead of just one instrument at a time, because we were all in the room together. We wanted to have this. Uh, old-fashioned, beautiful room sound, you know, like like a Count Basie record or something, you know. Um, so we'd have to, the whole, all the horns would have to play at once, one section of a tune, you know. Or or sometimes we, okay, we need the bridge. So we just played the bridge a little bit and inserted it in. So it's, this was a, a, a big production on a very low budget. So I had to, to try to use new techniques that I had learned uh, you know, to really make it uh, flow and be able to get the job done. But I think, I think I'm proud of this record. I think sometimes because of uh, the challenges it really makes you uh, rise to the occasion, you know. Anyway. Okay, the other one Lorna has? You want to do it now? Okay. All right. You guys want to see? I think it's only like three or four minutes long. Okay. by the spirit of Thelonious Monk, which is about experimentation, swing, feel, and modern contemporary harmony. Thank you. 
Uh, I apologize. That's, that was the wrong video. That's our promo video. It was not supposed to be, be this. Um, um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's an old Munkestra video. But um, I think tonight we're going to play a Munkestra song with the Moscow Jazz Orchestra, which is a pleasure. These guys are amazing musicians. Um, okay, maybe, maybe this, is, this might be fun. All right, this group of people, I want y'all to shout out one Russian song for me to learn. One, two, three, go. Okay. Do you understand? Wait a minute. What, what, what song? Okay. Can you write down the name for me? The name of the song? I'm not going to remember. I need to be write it down. I'm going to go YouTube and find it. Okay, over here. Another song. Katusha. Katusha. Maybe you should come do the gig. <laughs> ah, fantastic. So can you write this down for me or show me on my iPhone? You got it? OK, another song? Is there anything else? That's fantastic, I guess. Huh? All right. All right. Modern? That's OK. So uh, maybe we have time for one more question, and I think I have to get out of here. What? Any more questions? OK. It's been a total pleasure. Um, I'm sorry if, if my language is a little funny, the way I talk, but um, I, hope, uh, I hope I was able to share a little wisdom with you guys. And it was, it was great to get to know you. And, uh, uh, I'll be here all day, and I'll be hanging out, listening to music, and I'll see you tonight. Okay? Yeah.